Thank you all for joining me for this presentation about the history of the Truckee River watershed, its past pollution and future protection. This presentation is brought to you by One Truckee River with funding from the Western Regional Water Commission. My name is Carrie Jensen and I'm a landscape architect and environmental educator with Urban Ecology Solutions. I'm here today representing One Truckee River. I can't dream of telling you the entire history of our watershed in just an hour, but I am going to try to hit some of the highlights and I hope that you will be inspired to learn more about our watershed as well as to protect it into the future. I'm going to start out just with an introduction about One Truckee River since I'm here representing them today. One Truckee River is a partnership of public and private entities all working together as one to protect the Truckee River. They have formed a management plan that covers the urban stretch of the river from West McCarran to Sparks Boulevard. And that management plan was unanimously approved by the cities of Reno, Sparks, and Washoe County in 2016. It has a lot of goals and objectives. And don't worry, I'm not going to bore you today with going through all of the management plan. But I do want to touch on a couple of the goals as they relate to this presentation. The first is to ensure and protect the water quality and ecosystem health of the Truckee River. And another one is to make sure that we're creating an aware and engaged community that protects and cares for the river. And since we're talking about the history of the watershed, I wanna make sure that we all are on the same page and we understand what is a watershed. So a watershed is an area of land where all of the water drains or sheds off the land into one location. A really simple way to think about this is a natural bathtub with the ring of the bathtub being the mountain range and then the sides of the bathtub being all the streams that drain off of that rim and then the bottom of the bathtub being where all of the water eventually drains. So now that you understand what a watershed is in general concept, let's take a tour of the Truckee River watershed. You can see here on the map, the Truckee River watershed is outlined in the yellow kind of green lime and it starts up at Lake Tahoe, it flows down the Truckee River and it terminates out at Pyramid Lake. And although it's a pretty small watershed, especially when you compare it to watersheds throughout the United States, some of the really large ones like the Mississippi drainage, it still, because it has a small size, it still has a very complicated history as we'll see in this presentation today. And part of that has to do with the fact that it crosses state lines as shown in this map. California and Nevada, and it also goes across three nations, the United States, the lands of the Reno Sparks Indian Colony, as well as the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribes Reservation. As you said, it starts out up at Lake Tahoe. So this is the beginning of the tour here. And some fun facts about Lake Tahoe. It's one of the deepest lakes in the world and almost the deepest lake in the United States. It's second only to Crater Lake. And just to give you some perspective on the amount of water we're talking about in this lake, if you have a raindrop that falls into Lake Tahoe, it's estimated that it could take 650 years for it to exit out the outlet. And while there's over 60 different streams that flow into Lake Tahoe, there's only one outlet, and that is the Truckee River, which takes all of that snow melt up from the Sierras and Lake Tahoe and drains it out into the eastern side of the mountains here and is very important because it's drinking water supply for all of the population here in the Truckee Meadows and larger Reno Sparks area. And then the Truckee River drains out and it terminates at Pyramid Lake. And it's very special to note that our watershed does not drain out to the ocean like most watersheds in the world. It all drains just to this small little lake, Pyramid Lake in the desert. And that means because it's a closed basin or terminal basin where the water doesn't flow out to the ocean, it is also very susceptible to pollutants because any pollutants that we contribute to our watershed stay here and eventually drain to Pyramid Lake, which is also home to endemic and endangered fish species, such as the Kuyui and the Lahontan cutthroat trout. And now that you know about what a watershed is and have taken a little tour of the Truckee River watershed, let's dive into the history. We would be remiss to talk about the history of our watershed without sharing the voices of the tribes that have called this place home for thousands of years. So we're gonna start out this section about the history of our watershed with some messages from our local tribes, the Paiute, the Shoshone, and the Washoe. And they're gonna share some of the history and cultural importance of the water resources in our watershed. To kick things off, we're gonna go way back in history with the origin story of Pyramid Lake which is the story of Stone Mother, 
It illustrates the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe's deep cultural connection to the lake. According to Joe Ely, the tribe's former tribal chairman, the stone mother and her legend sets our identity and forever fixes the components that make up our way of life. Here is the story of Stone Mother told by Ralph Burns with subtitles in English. Not only does the tribe identify with the lake as their homeland and center of their culture, but they also identify with the fish of that lake because they are the main food source for their people, including the kuyui and the Lahontan cutthroat trout. And this is a photo here of the kuyui. Um, it's around these fish, which their culture is centered, has been formed and still exists today. So next I'm gonna show you a short clip from a film called Surviving the History of the Lahontan Cutthroat Trout. And this film is excellent. I would highly recommend that you watch the entire thing. But the introduction as um, from Dan Mosley does a really good job of explaining the cultural importance of the fish to the people. These fish is what sustain our people for thousands and thousands of years. We're fish eaters, kuyui eaters, trout eaters, and that's who we are. Next, we have a film from Reno Sparks Indian Colony. And this was recorded as part of a live presentation back in May for Truckee River Month. So please excuse, there's some background noises. Um, we're all really familiar with how Zoom has some of those at this point, um, but there's really good messaging in this. There's information from the tribe's cultural resource program manager, Michonne Eben. She's going to speak to us about the history and cultural importance of the Truckee River. So let's talk about the Truckee River, everybody. <laughs> So I want to tell you a little bit about um, a great Paiute man. He was honored by all his Paiute nation. He had a high, everybody had high regard for him. And um, when the white people began to come in, the Europeans, the migrants, the immigrants, when they began to travel into Nevada, um, we, um, the Paiute people knew that they were coming. They knew about this Europeans that were going to be around here in this area coming in through Nevada. And so, um, um, this great Paiute man, he would, when he would acknowledge, when he would acknowledge and see the white, his white brothers coming, he would say, oh, because he knew, he knew that all along, all across the country, that Native people were being killed and murdered. And so he knew that if he saw, if he saw any white people coming in, he would try to be calm, he would lay his down, and he would tell the people, it's okay, 
it's okay. Meaning all is good, all is well. He was telling them that it's okay, all is good. And so because of that, um, in the early 1800s, the, um, here comes Fremont, you know, the explorer, he was uh, the explorer, Fremont, and Fremont and um, this great Paiute man met about the early 1800s, met in the town of Wadsworth, Nevada today. And in that area, um, when, when the great Paiute man would talk to him, he would say, Troque. And so of course the European, the migrants and the explorers would think that he was telling him his name. And so hence came the name Truckee, Captain Truckee. And after that, the, the um, explorer named the Truckee River after him. And so I do wanna, um, I do wanna say that it's important to note that although the explorer um, Fremont named the river Truckee, we had our own names for the Truckee River. We had our own traditional names. We didn't call it the Truckee River. We had the name for this very beautiful flowing river and the river of what is um, what we have today. And I'll tell you, I'll talk a little bit about those names about the Truckee River that come from the Paiute and the Washoe people, because we knew that this river that flows 121 miles starting at Tahoe, Lake Tahoe, flowing all the way down 121 miles, all the way through Reno, as we know, all the way to Pyramid Lake. We know that it just was not one river. It's an active, live, spiritual, cultural being that's very important to us as people, as human beings. And so we would call the, we had different names for the river. Those names could be the big flow, where the good fish were, where the big fish, where we flowed through the river, where we had water movement to the Kuiui, where we would call it the narrow part of the river or we would know who that is so-and-so's fishing area, or we would know that that's where the big head, where the water would flow over the hedge and the, the, big, the big areas and the rocky areas. So we knew each and land. And so today, when you go to any type of event, you'll hear people, or you'll hear the speaker, or you'll hear the coordinator of that event talk about land acknowledgement. It's happening throughout all, throughout Indian country, north, south, um, America, and we're talking about when you acknowledge the land to the people, it's not only to those indigenous people that live in that land, but it's also the land you're acknowledging the people and the landscapes and the, the cultural traditional properties that are out there. The river, when you acknowledge the land in Truckee, Midder, in Truckee Meadows, talk about the river. That is what land acknowledgement is because without this river, we'd be nothing. We need this water. So when we talk about land management and land acknowledgement, the river are, is, a, is a traditional cultural property and it's very important to talk about those things. Uh, with that great message from Michonne about land acknowledgement, I also wanna take a moment to acknowledge that tribes were here long before we had words like watershed or management goals. They were sharing this place and honoring the rivers, streams, and lakes as stewards long before European occupation and settlement. And while any human activity along the river may have impacts, Native American impacts were small in comparison to those of industrial impacts, which came with European settlement, which is where we start the next part of our story with the pollution and the beginning of the Comstock load. This is really when industrial impact started to be seen in our watershed. And it started when silver was discovered up in Virginia City in 1859. Led to this big boom and bust industry of mining up in that area. And this historic photo shows kind of the end of that period. And you can see all the mine trailings and activity. That mining process took out the ore, but they needed water resources in order to process the ore and extract the silver. So all of the ore was then transported down, since there weren't a lot of water resources up in Virginia City, down to places like Washoe Lake. And you can see this historic photo here of Washoe City, kind of give you a perspective of what that town looked like at the time. And around Washoe Lake, there were lots of these ore mills that were constructed for processing all of the um, or to extract the silver. The biggest mill in the area was the Ofer Mill, constructed in 1861. And it was only in operation for about five years, but it contributed a legacy of mercury contamination that's still seen in our watershed today. 
And that is because the extraction process, when they extracted the silver out of the ore, they needed mercury. And so that was a byproduct of the milling process. And all of these different mills around Washoe Lake contributed mercury. And it's still seen today in Washoe Lake, as well as downstream into Steamboat Creek and out into the Truckee River. You can see from this historic photo from the 1970s, there's still remnants, or there were at that time, remnants of the piles of a causeway that was constructed across Washoe Lake in order to transport the ore from the east side over at Washoe City over to the west side where the mill was located, the Ofer Mill over here. So it's kind of fun to see that there were remnants of that causeway. And there's also remnants of the original Ofer Mill if you drive north on I-580, you can see these crumbling walls if you don't blink when you're going by at 65 miles an hour. And those are the original and what remains of the Ofer Mill. Simultaneously, right after the Comstock was getting started, they realized they needed a lot of materials to build all those mine shafts and buildings, as well as uh, fuel sources. So the lumber industry really took off in our area. And it started down around Washoe Lake, but moved quickly up into all parts of the watershed. It's estimated that 7 billion board feet of lumber and 10 million cords of fuel wood were extracted from the Truckee River watershed during the late 1800s. Now, those numbers are huge, so should give you kind of an idea that it's a lot. But just to help you visualize how much we're talking about, that amount of wood would be able to build a boardwalk 30 feet wide out of four inch planks around the entire earth. So I hope that gives you some sort of visualization of how much wood we're talking about and how big this industry was in our watershed. There were also sawmills that were constructed at lots of different tributaries all around the watershed to process the lumber. And this is just a historic photo of one of those mills. The first one was actually constructed at Franktown. And I don't have any photos of that original one at Franktown, but it does have kind of a fun story and background. It was founded by Elder Orson Hyde, shown here. He was one of the Mormon elders that founded the settlement at Franktown. And he invested $10,000 to bring materials over from Placerville to start this sawmill at Franktown. And he was only able to operate this mill for about a month before he got a call back to Salt Lake. Brigham Young called back many of the elders because of tensions with pioneers moving through the area. And so Elder Hyde here had to leave his claim and he, he rented it out to a man named Jacob Rose. And the records show that as a deposit for his sawmill, he got exactly one span of indifferent mules, a worn out harness, two yokes of oxen, and an old wagon. So just enough to get him back to Salt Lake, but not a lot for his huge investment in the sawmill. And he did try to come back several years later to reclaim that mill, but at that time it had been sold to another person and Nevada was now a territory and his original Mormon claim was not honored anymore. So he lost out on his large investment there. And while Franktown may have been the first place where a sawmill was constructed, it was certainly not the last. There are sawmills and lumber industry throughout the entire watershed, pretty much every tributary. And we can see here in this historic photo from Glenbrook at Lake Tahoe, you can see the deforestation in the background, which there weren't any documents of the amount of sediment and erosion that occurred during this time. But I think it's fair to say, based on photos, that we can see the amount of trees that were cut down, that there probably was some erosion associated with that and sedimentation that would have affected water quality in our watershed. And the other pollutant that the lumber industry really added into our water resources was sawdust. Most people don't think about that part, but when they mill the lumber, there's lots of residual sawdust. And you can actually see that in this photo here. There's kind of this rack line on the edge of Lake Tahoe with this lighter material. That is sawdust. Um, and it wouldn't have just been up at Lake Tahoe, but throughout the entire watershed. Moving downstream, we have the Verdi Lumber Company, and here you can see in this photo that they have a trestle here in the background. That trestle was used to be able to easily transport all of the sawdust residual out of the mill and dumped into the Truckee River, which was on the other side of that bank. Part of the reason they needed to do this is because sawdust is highly flammable. 
pretty obvious. And they didn't want fire within their mill, which would take down not only the investment of the mill, but also all of their inventory of logs. So they were very concerned about fire, wanted to dispose of the sawdust as quickly and economically as possible. And that meant dumping it into the adjacent waterways. There are records that show that at times the sawdust along the Truckee River would pile up to depths of three feet deep and it would ferment in the summer months. I can only imagine it wouldn't have been a very uh, pleasant place, especially when flows are low in the summertime. The river would have suffered from these pollutants and there was great concern for water quality downstream in the Reno Sparks area. This issue of sawdust came to be a big thing in the beginning of 1875. As shown here in the Truckee Republican, they quoted that the question of sawdust in the Truckee River has grown to such importance that it has received the recognition and championship of the governor of one state and seems in a fair way to occupy the councils of the whole nation. So big news. And part of that, they were mentioning a governor. That was the second governor of Nevada, Governor Bradley, shown here. And he got everybody thinking about this because he issued a report with concerns about decline in the fisheries in the Truckee River. And as part of that report, he actually went out to Pyramid Lake firsthand to look at conditions there. And what he reported in this report is that he saw a bar of sawdust at least a half mile in length, 300 yards in breadth, and three feet in depth. Through or over this bar of sawdust, there was no perceptible current or flow of stream. I saw hundreds of fine trout dead and rotting upon the shores. The air was poisoned with the stench of their decay. Now, as we can imagine, this caused quite a bit of controversy, and it was also a lot of finger pointing across state lines because the lumber industry at that point was mostly up in the upper watershed around Truckee. And so the Truckee Republican very quickly responded to his report. They said, Governor Bradley, it is false to say that tons of trout do not annually enter the river and pass upward until they encounter the slaughter pens, traps, grab hooks, basket nets, and obstruction, which are placed to receive them by your good citizens of Nevada. So they were saying, hey, the sawdust is not stopping the fish. It's all the fishermen along the river who are catching the fish. Maybe that has something to do with the fish decline. But then the Gold Hill News came back with a retort. They said, for years, this sawdust nuisance has been a growing evil and aggravation to the farmers of the Truckee Meadows and the sportsmen of our state. It is a nuisance without excuse, other than the picayunish disposition of a few millmen to save a dollar to themselves by inflicting damages to the amount of thousands upon the citizens of Nevada. And of course, it didn't end there. The Truckee Republican responded once again, this big back and forth in the newspaper at the time. They said, should Congress take such action to forbid the millmen of disposing of the sawdust without taking some steps toward finding out whether the case has been fairly stated, they will be doing an injustice to the lumbermen of this state. And what they were basically saying is, hey, you guys have no proof that it's the sawdust that's causing fish decline. And to some extent, that was true because water quality testing in that time was pretty much non-existent and they had no scientific way to prove that it was just the sawdust. So this went back and forth. And for many years, the sawdust was just continued to dump into the river until finally in 1889, legislation was passed to prohibit sawdust pollution. And just everybody could eventually agree down the line that it was probably different things that were causing fish decline, both overfishing as well as pollutants. But regardless, it was great to see that they finally cleaned up the pollution from sawdust or at least they did on paper. And that's when legislation was passed. But for many years after, there were still some culprit timber companies that continued to disobey the laws and dump a little bit of sawdust in. And one of those was the Truckee Lumber Company that was still in operation up around Truckee. They put a stop to this finally in 1894 when a fish commission a lawyer decided that he would try to revoke their corporate charter. So they then very quickly were like, oh, I guess we'll comply. So finally, this chapter of sawdust pollution came to a close for the Truckee River watershed. It was in some ways a moot point, though, because the lumber industry had started to decline greatly because they had just used up much of the lumber. And so there weren't supplies to be able to continue their operation. Operations. The Comstock load, when that sort of declined, the next industry that really came up in the Truckee Meadows was ranching. There were large cattle and sheep operations that opened up in the Truckee Meadows. And one of those was the historic Huffacre Ranch that's shown here was one of the largest operations. 
And all of the sheep and cattle, as I'm sure most of you are very well aware, sheep and cattle are not very discriminant about where they defecate. And they're often in and around water resources because you know, sheep and cattle need to drink as well. So although there's not any legal documentation of the amount of contamination from these large ranch operations, I think it's fair to say that there was probably some contamination as cows will go where they will. (laughs) And not only was there that contamination from ranching, the ranchers also very quickly used up native grasses and had to turn to alternative types of forage. And that meant farming alfalfa. And while alfalfa is pretty well adapted to arid climates, it does need some irrigation to get started. And so quickly, the ranching industry moved towards constructing irrigation ditches throughout the Truckee Meadows to be able to take water to their fields for growing alfalfa. So these irrigation ditches began to crisscross across the watershed. You can see from this photo here, um, this is actually the location of current day Mayberry Park. You can see many of the, the ditches that are still in place today. And the big steamboat ditch is actually up here on the ridge line. And not only were there irrigation ditches that were constructed all over the place, they also quickly found that as in most arid environments, if they don't provide proper drainage under their fields, they can get salt percolation. The salts that have built up in the soils over long periods of time can easily rise up, percolate to the top, and make the soil an arable and unusable for agricultural uses. So not only did they need irrigation ditches to bring the water in, then they also needed drainage ditches to take all of the salts away from their fields. And many of those historic drainage ditches are still seen in our area today too, including Boynton Slough and the North Truckee drainage, which would have drained all of these excess salts or total dissolved solids out into the Truckee River. And in this period between 1880, after the Comstock kind of died down, and 1900, all of these ranchers were in the area. And there were lots of cycles during that time of economic boom and bust. Um, There were depressions, as well as some historic droughts in the Western United States. And all of this kind of led to the political power to start to think about doing reclamation projects to bring bigger irrigation infrastructure into our area. And part of this was actually brought about because there was political concerns about the drop in population. So when the Comstock load petered out, all of the miners left for better pastures, so to speak. And so there were very few people left in our area. So much so that there was even to talk that with our low population, that maybe Nevada would be degraded back from a state back to a territory or even absorbed into Utah or Idaho. So there was great concern about this and political pressure to do something about it. And one of the things they thought is if we bring in more irrigation, we can have more small family farms. And so that really brought about the Derby Dam and Newlands Reclamation Project, which was finished in 1905. And this diverted almost half of the water from Truckee River into the Truckee Canal that takes water out to Lahontan Reservoir and then delivers it to farms out in Fallon and Fernley. And you can see here, this is that same farm we were looking at before out in Fernley that looked pretty dry and um, was suffering from drought conditions. So after the dam was constructed, there were some successes with more um, arable land coming into cultivation out in Fallon and Fernley. However, the dam reclamation project promised that there would be able to irrigate 300,000 acres of land and really bring in all these small farmers. And that promise did not come to pass. Um, Only about a third of the land that they thought they could bring into cultivation was able to occur. So the promise didn't really lead up to what they had said it would. And there were lots of uh, ramifications downstream as far as water quality is concerned. Most people might not think of a dam as a pollutant, but from the fact that it diverted fresh water away from the Truckee River, that means that for a lot less fresh water flowed to Pyramid Lake. And you can see from this photo here, 1867, the water levels at the lake. And then you can compare that to kind of modern times here in 1990 as shown in this photo. The lake levels at Pyramid Lake dropped significantly. And that means that there are less fresh water coming in. There's higher salts in the water and also uh, higher temperatures. Both of those things affect the fish population. So although we might not think of a dam as a pollutant, 
for downstream water quality, it very much was because it increased the salts as well as temperature. Not only did it drop the lake levels in Pyramid Lake, it also dried up the adjacent Winnemucca Lake entirely. And so this was once a wildlife refuge and, and provided habitat for fish and birds. And now that habitat is completely gone. At the same time, upstream, we have another chapter in the history of pollution of the Truckee River. And that was with the Floriston Pulp and Paper Company. And here's a photo showing that paper plant. It was constructed as a company town. And you can still see today some of the remnants of that town. There's an exit on I-80 for Floriston. And it was in operation for many years. And they directly discharged all of their chemicals and pollutants from the paper company into the river. There was a big uproar about this. Um, citizens down in Reno were actually really concerned about their water quality. And they knew that the paper company upstream probably had something to do with it. So they formed a committee to go up and investigate. And one of the first things they saw when this committee went into the paper company is a sign that said, do not drink river water. Same as impure good water is on trap and milk. So if there was any question as to whether or not the paper company knew that they were polluting, it was pretty obvious <laughs> from this sign that they, they knew. They were telling their employees, basically don't drink the water in the river. And this situation of concern down from Reno and the paper company responded many times with little things. They would make small changes like they installed a settling pond to collect some of the waste from their paper plant. But that settling pond was only located about 40 feet from the banks of the river. And investigators found that downstream from that settling pond, they were still seeing black ooze coming out of the sides and draining into the river. So even though the paper company did things to kind of placate and say, hey, we're solving the problem, they never actually solved the problem. There was lots of back and forth about potential litigation, but that never came to pass. And eventually this issue was resolved just because the paper company closed in the 30s. There wasn't enough supply basically to have the paper plant in operation anymore. So it came to a close on its own. But unfortunately, from the time it was first opened in 1900 until the 1930s, they polluted all of their waste into the Truckee River. Another fun chapter in the history of pollution in our watershed is sewage. All the cities along the river, originally when they were constructed, the way they dealt with their sewage is they had open ditches that took sewage from the houses and dumped it directly into the river. You might have noticed that many of the older neighborhoods in Reno have back alleyways. And this was because that sewage ditch would have been constructed around the back of your house, not through your front yard. <laughs> and although there were improvements made over time where they put the sewer into pipes, it still was directly discharged into the river without treatment for many, many years. I can only imagine, like, take a walk down along the river today, how beautiful it is. But at those times, it would have had all of these paper companies, chemicals, as well as raw sewage and residual sawdust. It would have been putrid and smelled horrible. There were also lots of outbreaks of typhoid and cholera and other waterborne illnesses at this time. So eventually, there was a sewer treatment plant installed in the Reno area in the 1930s. And you can see some of the strike photos of the construction of that first treatment plant here. And there were improvements made over time. This is the treatment plant shown in the 1950s. And then eventually in 1964, the Reno, the cities of Reno and Sparks came together and built a combined plant to treat all of the sewage from the entire area. And that is the Truckee Meadows Water Reclamation Facility, fondly called Tum Wharf. It's located on the east side of Sparks, where Steamboat Creek, shown here, where it, with its confluence with the Truckee River. And that plant has been expanded over time to meet the demand of our population. Population. And we can see here a more modern view of the plant today, which looks pretty much the same. And it treats all of the water from our area. And the recycled water that is taken from this is then pumped either back into the Truckee River or delivered to customers for recycled water use and irrigation. 
Okay, so we've gone through a lot of chapters of different pollutants through this industrial period. And I just want to point out that a lot of those have come and gone. We've resolved many of the bigger pollutants that occurred um, since the time of the Comstock load. And so the water quality of the Truckee River today is fortunately much better than it would have been in 1900. That still doesn't mean that we don't have pollutants, though. It may be much cleaner than it once was, but we're still dealing with different kinds of pollutants. And those come from urban development, which really has its boom starting in the 1960s, or even further back, really started with the Lincoln Highway being constructed through our area. It put us onto the transportation larger network throughout the United States. And so we had lots of people moving through our area and expansion, as well as the growth of the tourism and gaming industry in the Reno Sparks area. This list led to an awful lot of growth. You can see here from this historic photo in the 60s, what downtown looked like at that time, not too many big buildings. And also suburban um, development hadn't reached very far. This is Virginia Lake out here in the corner. So you can think about this, that in the 60s, the suburban development had not even reached out to the McCarran Loop yet. And obviously today we know that it goes much further than that. And you can see this is a photo from 2011 showing the expansion of the downtown area, as well as the expansion of the suburban areas that surround it out into the mini valleys. And I should mention that with all of this new development, what comes is an awful lot of impermeable surfaces, which is just a fancy way of saying asphalt and concrete are surfaces that water cannot go through. And just to kind of explain this concept a little more, I've got a graphic here from the EPA. If you look on the left-hand side, we've got a wooded natural area. And when it rains, the water comes down and a lot of it is able to infiltrate down through the soil or it's used by the vegetation and evapotranspirated. Very little of the water flows across the surface of the land. Conversely, on the right side, we have an urban scenario where when we have precipitation, we've got all that asphalt and concrete that has been put down. And now the water cannot infiltrate down through the soil. And there's often less vegetation. So we have less evapotranspiration. And consequently, we get a lot more water moving across the surface of our streets. We need a place for all of that water to go. If we don't give it a place to go, every time it rains, our city would flood. So engineers have put in this system called the storm drain system. So it takes all that water from our streets whenever it rains and drains it off into an underground system of pipes that then take it out to our local streams and eventually those all drain to the Truckee River. All of that water does not get cleaned. And often people confuse the storm drain system with the sanitary sewer. They're different. So anytime you flush the toilet or put something down your sink in your house, that goes down the pipes into the sewer system. And the sewer goes out to that treatment plant that we talked about in East Sparks, where it gets cleaned before it's pumped back into the river. On the other hand, the storm drain system, taking all that water from our streets, that does not get cleaned. And so any pollutants that it picks up along the way then can go out into the river. And we'll talk about some of those pollutants that it picks up, these urban runoff pollutants. These can include chemicals from cars, such as oil and antifreeze and brake particles, as well as soaps from car washes. Those contain phosphates that we don't want in our water. Trash and litter that can be picked up and washed into the storm drain, as well as pet waste, which can contain E. coli and other harmful bacteria. Sediments, another pollutant. We don't want muddy waters. Nitrogen and phosphorus from fertilizers, especially if we use those in excess on our yards, then they can easily get washed off when we turn on our sprinklers and go down that storm drain. When they reach our local waterways, that fertilizer then can cause algae blooms, and those algae blooms can then suck the oxygen out of the water, causing fish die off. There's also pesticides that can easily wash off and go down the storm drain. And people are pretty aware of this issue right now with regards to beneficial insects like bees and butterflies, the impacts that pesticides can have on them. But they're not as aware of the impacts they can also have on our aquatic insects. If it washes down the storm drain out into the river, then it can also affect our macro and vertebrates such as this mayfly that live in the river. And they're really important because they're the bottom of the food chain and support all of our fish. So now you're probably like totally overwhelmed <laughs> and you're like, oh gosh, we've had lots of different pollutants throughout time and we're still dealing with all of these urban runoff pollutants. So what am I supposed to do? Well, there's lots of ways that you can help. 
One of the ways you can help, especially with the litter uh, issue and all of that that washes into our waterways, is to help with a local cleanup. Keep Truckee Meadows Beautiful has two cleanups a year, and their one in the fall concentrates on locations along the Truckee River. The next one's coming up September 25th, and you can sign up on their website to volunteer and help with one of those cleanup efforts. You'd also be surprised to find that a lot of those urban runoff pollutants we were talking about actually start in your yard. So a lot of the things you can do to help protect the river is to use practices in your yard that help keep water on site and reduce our pollutants. And you don't have to live next to the river. Anywhere that you live within the entire watershed, the entire watershed has this storm drain system that takes water that eventually drains to the river. So if you live even really far away, like South Meadows or out in Spanish Springs, you're still connected to the river through this storm drain system. And so anything that you add to your yard that could be pollutants that could wash off could eventually end up in the river. So we can all do our part by using river-friendly landscaping principles. And I'm going to quickly go through those major elements, kind of give you some ideas of things you can do in your own yard to protect the river. There are six major principles. The first is to keep water on site so that we quit watering sidewalks. And a really easy way to do this is to move our sprinklers away from the sidewalk so that then we don't have this issue and we can keep all of the water on site but still keep our lawn. So this creates like a little buffer strip where you can put in water wise plants that are on a drip irrigation system and then keeps your lawn away from the sidewalk so that it doesn't have the potential to take those fertilizers and wash them off with the sprinklers into the storm drain. We also want to avoid taking water from our downspouts off our roof and piping it straight out into the storm drain system. Instead, if we can, we want to soak up that water on site. And we can use strategies like putting that water into a dry swale or a rain garden or even using rain barrels to help keep that water on site. There's also pervious concrete or other permeable paving options. There's new technologies are really cool. They basically take hardscaping and allow water Water to flow through so then we don't have as many of those awful impermeable surfaces and we can try the using these technologies for paths and driveways in our yards. The second major principle is to reduce pollutants. This means taking your car to the car wash instead of washing it in the driveway, dechlorinating any pool or spa water before you discharge it, using fertilizers responsibly and making sure we follow the instructions so we're not using more than is necessary. Also being careful about the placement of DG or decomposed granite. It easily erodes and goes into storm drains. So we need to make sure that we place it in areas that aren't on slopes or next to sidewalks. The third major principle is to use water wisely because we live in a high desert and it just makes sense. So talking about that, we're returning to the not watering sidewalks anymore. And this can really mean just trying to make your irrigation system as efficient as possible so it doesn't run off and also fixing any leaks that may occur. And since irrigation systems are often kind of intimidating for people, you can hire a qualified water efficient landscaper, also known as a quell professional. There's a certification process. If you just go on Google and Google quell, you can look up local professionals that have gone through this training here. They are specially trained to be able to come out and do water audits on your landscape and help you adjust your irrigation to make it as efficient as possible. So you're saving water and making sure that it's not running off and going down the storm drain. We can also just follow Tumwa or the Truckee Meadows Water Authority's watering guidelines. This helps us to save water. And I particularly like to point out that they recommend you don't water when it's windy, um, which seems obvious, but I see people do it all the time. And the issue there is if we're watering when it's windy, it just gets blown off onto sidewalks and down the storm drain. Also upgrading our irrigation technologies to drip wherever possible. If we're dripping in gallons per hour instead of gallons per minute, that's a lot less Less potential for runoff and using water wise plants in our landscapes that don't require as much water to begin with can help reduce runoff too. The fourth principle is to build healthy soils because if we have healthy soils with lots of organic matter those help hold water on our sites and promote healthy plants. You can help to build up that organic matter in your soils by using mulches especially in areas that are away from your home. We don't want to put wood bark mulch up against the edge of our home for fire concerns, but away from the home, you can use it to then help build the soils and protect them from erosion. 
can also try backyard composting. If we compost our food scraps and yard waste, we can then add that back into our soil and help build that organic matter to hold more moisture in our soils. We can also use strategies like grass cycling, which just means that when we mow the lawn, we mow it more frequently. We take off the bag and then we get really small uh, clippings that we let fall in place and compost in place. We don't bag them up and remove them because then as they decompose, they add nutrients back into the soil, feeding the soil and meaning you don't have to fertilize as often. The fifth principle is to create wildlife habitat. And this means providing food, water, and shelter for beneficial insects and birds. And also reducing our pesticide use, because as this bee points out, if we provide lots of nice habitat, it's not beneficial if we then cover it in poison or seasoning, as he says. And the sixth principle is to prepare for wildfire. And this is because large scale wildfires can have impacts that are long lasting on watersheds and water quality. So we can all do our part to help prepare for wildfire in our area. And this really means making sure that you're conscious of removing flammable materials, especially in that ignition zone in the five feet around your home, and then creating defensible space if you have property where it goes out further. Key tips are making sure you clean out your gutters, remove that wood bark mulch and leaves from around your house, and then create that defensible space. So that's my quick overview of river-friendly landscaping. I hope it's given you an awful lot of ideas and tips of ways that you can work to protect the water quality of the Truckee River from your own yard. And not only can you do that, but the other thing I really want to encourage people to do, we talked in the beginning about that the goals of the management plan were to make sure that we're protecting water quality, but also that we're creating an engaged community that's all working together to protect the river. So not only do I want you to try to put some of these practices in place in your own yard or volunteer for a cleanup, but I also want you to help spread the word. So I challenge you today to take something that you've learned from this presentation and share it with somebody else in our community, be it a friend, a family member, or a colleague. And if you don't have time to talk or um, you want to make it really easy, we have social media. You can always just hit a button and share. We have lots of different tips on One Trekkie River's Facebook and Instagram page for ways that you can care for and protect the river. So you can just share those with others from there as well. And just a quick disclaimer, any of the information that I provided is for education only. Uh, use it at your own risk and make sure you follow local codes and consult professionals.